Here we are again. Episode, I don't know, what are we at now? Five, four, let's see. We did intro, preface, chapter one, chapter two. Um, we should have had a Q&A by now. So I guess this is chap uh, chapter three, episode five. Welcome to Stoicism for a Better Life, where unprofessionalism is the standard. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like we're trying something new. I'm recording these ahead of time, so uh, excuse me on the episode. We're on episode this one, reading chapter three from this little gem of a book right here. As you can see, beautiful art piece, your user's manual. My first book that actually launched my career as Anderson Silver. So here we go. Chapter three. You are not special. In quantum physics... Quarks go in and out of existence, or rather, from our dimension. Quarks are the smallest particle of matter that we have discovered to date, of course. When matter and antimatter appear at the same time and pair up, they cancel each other out and disappear. Right before the Big Bang, in the grand scale, there would have been about equal amounts of matter and antimatter. However, at any given time, there may be some small amounts of quarks in existence, in our dimension, waiting for antiquarks to appear so that they may pair up and annihilate each other. This also happens vice versa, in that there may be pockets of antiquarks that lay around waiting to be paired up as well. 13.8 billion years ago, as matter and antimatter were popping in and out of existence, the Big Bang, fueled by the minor amounts of quarks that were floating around and left over waiting for their pairs, began the expansion of our universe. Again, from this minuscule amount of leftover quarks, our entire visible universe was created. This visible universe stretches 93 billion light years across and was made up of a minor amount of quarks that were just waiting around for their antiquarks. These are truly cosmic and humbling scales. I mean, a beam of light, the fastest thing known to us, would take 93 billion years just to traverse the visible universe. Compared to little old you, the universe is colossal. Now consider yourself and your significance within the universe. To say you are small in the cosmic scale of things is a gross overstatement. Think about the sheer quantity of events that must have occurred in the history of this giant, vast, 13.8 billion year old universe. You have been around for a handful of years, and at maturity, might make it past a century. That means you are a participant in 7.25 times 10 to the minus 90, or... 0.0000000725% of the known life of the visible planet of the universe. In other words, you are a totally and utterly insignificant part of the universe in the cosmic scale of things. But you are a homo sapien. You are the crown jewel of the universe. No? Uh, not quite so. For starters, if we have life on this planet, that means the universe contains the building blocks for life. With the universe's scale, size, and longevity, it is a statistical certainty that life exists or existed elsewhere, always has existed, and always will, as long as the universe is around and doing its thing. With the universe's scale, size, and longevity, it is a statistical certainty that life exists elsewhere, always has existed, and always will, as long as the universe is around and doing its thing. The fact that we have not yet detected life elsewhere has more to do with our lack of technological capabilities than it has to do with the question of life existing elsewhere in the universe or not. From a philosophical perspective, to think life is unique to our small and unassuming planet, circling a relatively common star, would be to ignore the simple fact that we come from stardust. And that stardust is abundant everywhere in the universe. 
It would also ignore the fact that the rules of the universe are consistent and the same everywhere. And so with stardust everywhere and the laws of the universe being the same everywhere, well, again, life must also be everywhere, must have been around for a long time, and will still be for a long time to come. Even if we were to have a delusion that life is unique to our planet, as a species, we are one of the most unsuccessful animals to ever roam the planet. Every other animal has learned to live with its environment and survived for long periods of time. The dinosaurs existed for 165 million years. The shark has been around for 425 million years. The collective human species, genus Homo, has been around for a mere 2 million years, and we have been nothing but destructive, causing more deaths and extinction extinctions ah, ta, ta. we have caused more deaths and extinction jeez i can't say it extinctions than any other predator a quick footnote on homo sapiens here some more commonly known human species are the homo neanderthalensis commonly referred to as neanderthals and homo erectus the most successful of any human species in terms of longevity however in recent in recent However, in recent years, many more discoveries have been made of other different extinct human species, including Homo florensiensis, who lived in an island in Indonesia, and the adults grew to a height of three feet. Pygmies, yo. Pygmies existed. <laughs> All right, back to the book. But we are Homo sapiens. The word sapien comes from the Latin word for wise. We built cities. We developed advanced technologies. We built rockets and explored space. We have modern medicine and cars and flying machines and the internet. We have achieved so much. We must be important and special in some way, right? Do not deceive yourself. Even among all the different human species, we, Homo sapiens, are the most destructive and short-sighted. Homo erectus, for example, lived for almost 2 million years and thrived in East Asia. Homo sapiens, conversely, evolved in East Africa 150,000 years ago and willingly or unwillingly killed off all the remaining human species. Every single one of them we exterminated. And with our self-destructive tendencies, given the current state of affairs today, we do not even have a good shot at making it to 200,000 years of existence by the look of things. Beyond that, even amongst our species, there are 7.6 billion humans on the planet today. Ask yourself very, very honestly, what makes you more special than any other human being today? Are the rich more special and therefore more deserving of the universe than the poor because they have accumulated more material goods? Does the honest worker deserve more from the universe than the criminal? You may have your opinions, but the simple and unavoidable truth is that the universe does not care, and nature does not play favorites. We all live by the same unbreakable rules of the universe. We all need food, we all need water, we all have a circadian rhythm, and we all suffer from the human condition. Any needs, quote-unquote, beyond the universe's imposed rules are superfluous constructs that we, the only remaining human species, have created, and we choose to live by them. But this does not change the fact that anything over and above what the universe and nature demands from us is extra pretend stuff that we do not really need. Many ancient philosophers manifested this in the way they lived. For example, Diogenes who was an eminent philosopher from the school of cynics, had no possessions except for his cloak and staff, and he slept and ate wherever he wanted. In other words, he was homeless by choice. The iconic and famous philosopher was once visited by Alexander the Great, who was an admirer of his teachings. The magnanimous emperor once visited Diogenes and said that he would grant the philosopher anything he wished from his vast empire, to make him happy and improve his life. When Alexander asked Diogenes what he wanted, Diogenes replied simply this, 
that the emperor moved slightly to his right as he was blocking his son. You guys have a good one. Stay cool. Be yourself. Be a good human being. I'm rooting for you. And I'll talk to you next time.